to manage, the, you know, elect the stuff yeah. isn't going to make yeah. it to. You don't read this stuff. So. Hello, everyone. We are letting people in as we speak. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our lunch and learn. Let's just hang on and see more of the name. Uh, there are still people coming in, so we're going to let everyone in. Norman, Sue, you have two devices on, so that's going to create that echo. So you have to mute both of them, uh, uh, definitely at least one of them. People are still coming in. We're going to let people come in for a couple minutes. It's great to see everyone. Hey. Len, I don't know if you're trying to. There we go. Let me make a couple of introductory comments. If folks can hear me, I think I'm unmuted, right? You're good. You're good. All right. Well, um, welcome to our uh, final lunch and learn of the uh, season. It's good to um, see everyone. Howard, good to see you and our, one of our uh, uh, long, long standing members and others. Mitch Rothman, good to see you. Um, we, a couple of announcements before we get into our um, discussion. First of all, uh, to the extent you could stay on mute, except when you want to ask a question, that'd be great. Uh, secondly, um, we have listed dates for next year. Uh, and those are on the, uh, in the uh, email notice. So why don't you calendar them? I think we're probably going, there they are, great. Um, I think we're probably gonna stay virtual through the fall, whether or not we mix in an in-person effort in 2023 is open for discussion, but most important, put down the dates and we'll again have a mixture of uh, our rabbis, our chazan, uh, and um, some great topics. So um, thank you for noting those dates. Um, if you would like to have anybody added or deleted, but certainly added to the, to the email list so they get notices, certainly um, send me an email and I'll put my email in the chat if um, you're not familiar with it. Um, last, um, item I want to say by way of introduction is um, there's nothing in uh, the contracts of any uh, clergy member which says you must do lunch and learn. It's the hard work, uh, the creativity, and the partnering uh, of our uh, clergy that makes this go. And most obviously, it's the leadership and the uh, dedication the creativity, the wisdom of Rabbi Eric that drives this. So um, I want to thank uh, him for being such a great partner as we finish another season. 
and we uh, come upon September where, where we will start yet another season, season of the Adith Israel Lunch and Learn. Um, so Rabbi Eric, uh, you have the floor and thank you again for uh, teaching us so well. Great to see you and hear you. And before uh, Len just becomes one of the learners here, um, I want to acknowledge that he is so much more than that as well. <clears throat> His organizational skills and the ability that he uh, has to sustain this learning community is really, really wonderful. Oh, there's still people coming in. Sorry, I'm. Uh, 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 that's good. Good problem to have. Um, but uh, but Len, thank you for keeping us going and also keeping us um, together, even in this Zoom format. Uh, the opportunity to learn together is really something that I value and the high level of, of intellect that uh, this group brings is something that I, that I always look forward to. And I haven't been with you uh, for a couple of months because you had uh, some other um, Adith Israel clergy presenters. So I'm, I'm glad to be back with you. Uh, which is which is really lovely. So thank you, Len, uh, as well. We should acknowledge your your uh, part in this. Um, so I'm going to begin today with an acknowledgement that we're not going to end with real conclusive uh, marching orders here we're gonna be talking about how to respond to an unspeakable tragedy and crime that happened in Uvalde, Texas this past week. And we're going to approach it from three avenues a week out now, because now we're in the, you know, uh, to, to use the Jewish metaphor of time, which has been uh, universalized by many psychologists and therapists to say that there's some real psychic uh, wisdom in how we mourn and how the human psyche mourns. That is to say, we are uh, just about at the end of Shiva. Now, it's an overwhelmingly uh, Catholic community uh, with some evangelical Christians as well um, in Uvalde. And so um, I don't by any means intend to impose our uh, way of mourning on anyone else. However, uh, as I said, psychologists and psychiatrists have, have recognized that the sort of incremental, the idea that um, a week out, especially when we uh, construct that week by putting us in the context of immersive memory. A week out is a first tier of memory and then a month, which we would call the Shloshim, and then around a year. And I've heard this from countless people. People say, I've been so immersed in, and almost have a brain fog. And it just at the end of a year starts to, after a loss, starts to feel like, we can think again and fully re-enter the world again. So many people say to me, it feels like the world is spinning faster than I am able to keep up after a foundational loss. Um, the funerals are ongoing in Uvalde right now. And uh, in fact, I believe yesterday or the day before was the last funeral for those who were murdered at the supermarket in Buffalo. And while Jewishly, we tend to very quickly and then process other cultures and faiths do it, you know, almost in an inverse way. Um, and I wanna honor that. <clears throat> but when you get to that first week, we're at a point where at the end of Shiva, the immersion, you start to look out from the immersion of the enormity of the loss and go into a subsequent phase of mourning, which is in some way meaning-making. How am I going to live in this world and understand this world without this person whom I've loved? And so here we are 
in our Jewish timetable, imposing that admittedly on uh, people who do not share our, our faith, here we are trying to enter a world and comprehend a world where these school shootings, not only this school shooting, but these school shootings happen. And we're gonna take a three-prong approach to that, which I'm gonna go through in a second. One is an intellectual approach, one is an emotional approach, and one is a uh, collective, uh, almost credibility approach. Uh, I will explain that in just a moment as a way of starting to process this. But I want to um, share with you something that was different about this uh, particular school shooting. And I, I actually was in many ways rattled by this uh, anew, not only the sheer numbers and horrific, horrific stories that have come out. And I know there are more stories coming out about law enforcement and all of those other things, which we will, when we get to one prong, we will, we will deal with. But um, normally at Adith Israel, when there has been in the past a school shooting. And I just wanna say that that statement right there, there that I said is a horrific statement. What I just said was normally in the wake of a school shooting because there is nothing, nothing normal about this. But normally in the wake of a school shooting, we hear uh, understandably agitated parents of our uh, especially of our early childhood learning center, saying, what are we doing more? How can we be, be responsive? D is now when we're going to add, yeah, and I don't mean to say this in a flip way, but you know, sometimes it's so understandably um, agitated that the suggestions of what we should be doing for security become uh, in some ways uh, you know, uh, over the top, right? Uh, we should have uh, triple our number of security guards and we need metal detectors and we need uh, bomb sniffing dogs and we need, you know, to change the glass on this and change the, you know, and, and there are so many things. And obviously from a feasibility standpoint, we can't do all of those things overnight, even if we could source all the materials. Um, and we constantly at the synagogue as too many synagogues do, we constantly are looking at our security plans and reevaluating them in consultation with the Lower Marion Police Department and our security professionals uh, that are our trusted advisors and other school security professionals that sort of serve as a council of elders on this and frankly, Homeland Security, we are constantly revising these things. So to be responsive, to be responsive um, and say, you know, it's kind of like uh, what, what people say about the, the, the shoe bomber. Well, there was a bomb in, in the shoe. And so uh, therefore we take off our shoes. That responsive is less effective than in a constancy evaluating our protocols. And I should say, and I'll say this as a disclaimer right now, part of our security protocols are that we don't share the details of our security protocols. Right, so um, so we're not going to get into the the details thing. But normally, again, horrible to say, but normally in the wake of a school shooting, we hear from dozens of parents who are saying, "Have you considered this? What about this? I demand you do this. This should be changed. This has to be upgraded. This should be done." And and you know that can be overwhelming. And of course, we touch base and say however horrifically to our security professionals, is there anything that you as professionals learned from this past uh, tactical uh, in, um, you know, invasion that, um, that we should sadly learn from? And so we do that and we then spend, what is my job is the pastoral side of that, which is frankly calming the parents down and getting everyone to a baseline of this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, this is the part we can't share with you. And we hope that in consultation with these professionals, you can come to feel safe as you entrust your babies with us. 
That's normally what happens. This time, I received zero calls from parents. And on the one hand, that is, you know, it makes the pastoral task less. And on the other hand, that crushed me. Because what I think that means, it may mean that people are more in their silos because of COVID and because we haven't sort of thought as globally and communally as that. It may mean that, but I think more likely, since they're giving us their babies still, I think more likely it means that people see this not as extraordinary. That people are now viewing a school shooting as something that happens. And as long as they have sufficient faith in us that we are doing what we can and sufficient rational knowledge to know that what we can do is not everything, is not foolproof, is not airtight, that this is part of our society now. There was no uproar from our parents. And that to me was, that silence was both deafening and, and crushing, absolutely crushing. So I then moved on to try to process this in a different way. Normally I'm processing it pastorally to our parents. And I didn't have that task. So it happened that I had the day before um, the shooting, I had been in a session as part of the Zionist Rabbinic Coalition that is a new organization that is sort of getting off the ground of rabbis who affirm the connection between the United States and Israel and, and world Judaism as, uh, and Zionism as a core Jewish pursuit and ideal. Um, we had been learning with Alicia Wiesel. Alicia Wiesel is Ellie Wiesel's son. And he is brilliant and, you know, he comes by it naturally. Um, and uh, he is, uh, you know, he, there were certain things that I think, you know, he, he was not speaking of his politics or, or certain things like that, but what he gave us was a model of, um, of response as Jewish leaders that I want, I then tried to apply to um, the tragedy in Uvalde. Um, he was talking about applying it to uh, acts of anti-Semitism uh, and the growing threat of anti-Semitism. But I think the model is one that is really Im important to help us process and a little bit different than the way we typically process, especially if you've been on social media. Um, and so I'm going to present the model to you and then apply it. And I want you to, and I think it's going to challenge you. I, I know it's going to challenge you because it's designed to push our comfort levels. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So again, just a reminder, once I share my screen, I don't get to see your punums. So uh, I don't get to see your faces. So um, if you want to say something, you can either put it in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and don't be shy because I won't be able to see hands up and things like that. Um, here we go. Let's go back to the beginning. Here we go. So it's ironic for a rabbi to say beyond thoughts and prayers because that's kind of my currency. I do a lot of thinking. I do a fair amount of praying. But one of the things that I've been seeing on uh, constantly on uh, at least my social media um, feed is that thoughts and prayers are what every politician and every leader and every social media poster says how we should respond. And I called it responding to a seemingly intractable tragedy, the idea that this is constantly happening and to the point where our parents even were, were almost resigned to it and were not railing against it. 
Um, and uh, the approach that we're gonna take is an approach that's sometimes used with persuasion, it's sometimes used with leadership, and these are the three sort of prongs of it, okay? And forgive me if some of you know of this or have applied it in other ways, but here's how it works. When we are uh, assessing a challenge, a threat, an urgent need, whatever it may be, there are three ways to approach. Um, the first is the one that we often see, which is ethos. Uh, sorry, pathos. Let's start with pathos. Pathos is our emotional imme immediate response. Our pathos is um, outrage. Our pathos is, how could this happen? I feel insecure. I feel terrified. I feel uh, angry. I feel um, attacked. I feel, you know, uh, if you're someone who... Um, is, you know, who, who finds themselves uh, advocating for gun rights, uh, you may feel uh, that your position is being criticized and that may make you defensive. Uh, if you are someone who is a victim of this, you may feel, uh, yes, how I wrote, uh, pathos equals emotions. You can see that on the uh, emotions and feelings. There's like a little bit of a, uh, I believe these are Greek words, but um, but you, there's a little bit of an explanation, yes. And so, um, uh, if you're someone who who has a loved one who has been a victim of or uh, of gun violence, you may feel uh, a knee jerk uh, anxiety and and panic, right? And and a feeling of being unsafe. All of that goes into there. What is often seen as the uh, opposite of that, though, I think the fact that there are three of them means that it's not such polar opposites as a, as a binary situation, is logos. Logos is typically we're given up here, but you know that in ancient Judaism, the intellect, the seat of the intellect was given as the heart, right? So, but, uh, so let's, uh, you know, the, the, the classic, oh, this is my, how I feel, this is how I think. It's not exactly the same in Judaism, but, um, logos is what it sounds like. It's logic, it's rationalism, it's reason. Right. Um, and uh, this is where we start to analyze maybe some facts. Um, sometimes this is uh, facts of what did and uh, uh, didn't go right and wrong. Sometimes this feels when we enter logos that we are betraying our pathos. So how does that work? Um, I'll give you an example unrelated to uh, Uvalde, though uh, a recent one that made us feel uh, vulnerable, which was the Colleyville um, hostage taking of the of the synagogue on Shabbat, right? Okay, so everyone feels like, oh my God, I was in shul. This could have been my shul. The, uh, uh, could it be my shul? Should I go to shul? All of that is the emotional immediate response. How could this happen? Are we in a world where anti said, why isn't the world more outraged by this? Um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, all of that is the emotional piece. And then we start to talk about the logos and then, and, 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 and um, so this starts to come in and people start to say things like, um, well, you know, the rabbi let him in for a cup of tea. And that was a breach of, uh, of, of security protocol. And it starts to undo some of the pathos or it feels like it does. And I would argue that it doesn't actually undo it. What it actually does is it, it puts the two in tension and that you need both and the third one, which we're gonna get to in a second, we're gonna get to ethos. Um, you need both because you can't run a security situation on emotion and you can't run a security situation without acknowledging that emotion in and as part and parcel to the uh, systems that you set. If you know that people are going to be afraid, you have to put that, you have to embed that into the rational, procedural pieces of it. If people are going to run and stampede, you have to have ways for them to run and stampede because you can't, or you have to train them and train their heads so that they will act or at least wire in there some rational situation. So I'll, I'll give you an example of the way these two things work that is totally um, unrelated. When I, uh, I uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll be going up to Camp Ramah for my, uh, I think 18th or 19th summer. 
on staff, right? And I was a camper before that. And uh, I do this thing with our junior counselors, with our youngest bunk staff. And I do it with the head of security and facilities. Um, and we, here's what we do. We take a couple canisters of gasoline and we go out to a parking lot where no one is and fire extinguishers. And he puts a, a, a strip of gasoline. I don't do any of this by the way, because I'm a little bit of a wimp. Um, and, uh, but he, but, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. We're gonna go back. Uh, he puts a strip of gasoline and he lights it on fire and he has shows everyone the proper way to run through a low lying fire with your knees up, your hands across your chest. If you haven't done it before, it's a good thing to do. And then at the far end of it, there's a fire extinguisher and he shows them how to put out a small fire. And the reason for this is because everyone in the whole camp is made out of wood, right? Everyone is afraid of a fire. And if you are in charge of children and everyone is freaking out because it's a fire, everyone's going to be running in different, different directions. They're going to be screaming. They're going to be endangering themselves more. You have to also have wired in there somewhere the logos to know how to act, how to run through that fire, to get to the fire extinguisher and show those kids how to get out of that building. And so it, if you can pre-wire the logos, that's a good thing. So the whole idea is that instead of having a fully emotional fear response, we'll also have wired in there some rational response of what to do and how to do it responsibly. The third one is also embedded into that, which is ethos, because you have to be the one. As we say in Pirkei Avot, in Ethics of the Ancestors, b'makom she'en ish, in a place where there are no people to stand up and do the thing, you got to be the guy or the girl. I don't care which, but you got to be. You got to step up. And this is where questions of leadership come in. This is where questions of credibility come in. This is where broader overarching ethical concerns come into the conversation. And the interplay between the three of these things is what essentially persuades or moves the needle on a conversation how to respond. Someone had put into the chat that these are used in public speaking, right? This is very much uh, a part of how we as rabbis, like I have to know and I have to be very purposeful about the balance between these three things. So now I'm gonna apply it to this and then we're gonna apply it to um, to the horrific school shooting in Uvalde. So when I get up and speak, I need all three of these. I get up and speak, I'm given that Bima because at least nominally, at least titularly, because of my ethos. Because someone decided, better or worse, smart or stupid, to make me a rabbi. And that automatically, assuming that I haven't blown that, that automatically gives me the stature to get up and say things. By the way, I'm very careful about that. You're gonna see that one of the texts that I put on here is that I, I know what I'm not an expert on. There used to be, uh, this is probably two generations ago of rabbis, that rabbis were ascribed, uh, doctors were given the same professional assumption of expertise, right? That, that we knew everything, even the things we knew nothing about. Nowadays, we ascribe that to just the loudest voice and the most number of clicks on social media is given that sense of that air of authority, right? I am very careful to not overstate my ethos, but I know that it's there. And I know that certain people give me uh, credence even when I don't want to take it, even when I say, even when the more disclaimers that I say, oh, I'm not sure, sure I'm an expert on this, but uh, people are saying, well, we don't care if you're an expert. We want to hear what the rabbi has to say about blank, right? Um, and so I clearly am given by, uh, by the fact of the, the role that I play and, and hopefully by, I, ho I would like to think by the relationships that I've built with people over time, I'm given a, a certain a certain amount of ethos to convince people or to, to persuade people or to enlighten people or uplift people or console people or whatever it is. 
Uh, oftentimes that is because of the title. Sometimes it's because of a, of an, a longstanding relationship that we have, all, all sorts of things that that can, that can come. By the way, it's very, especially in today's world, ethos is very fragile, right? Um, uh, like I said, two generations ago, people were much more likely to put a higher level of nominal trust into people who had certain titles or positions, right? Nowadays, that's less true. I mean, some of you remember- This is Alice Israel, it started yes, already. Oh, wait. <laughs> that's, uh, okay, there we go. Um, uh, there was a time when the world was what Walter Cronkite said it was. And some of you remember that. And that amount of power, first of all, it doesn't exist anymore in most cases, but that amount of power was very, very formidable. Um, my logos is the intellectual piece that I, I, I try to bring to things. The, the, uh, the learning that we can do, the, the texts that uh, our tradition, the collective wisdom of 2000 years or more that our tradition can bring to illumine even a seemingly unrelated topic. The idea we take is sort of axiomatic that, that the Talmud and the Torah have things to say about almost everything, even things that might have been generationally unimaginable going back time, the, that there is a, 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 a logical, rational learning piece to it. And then the pathos is, is frankly the emotion that I bring to something. The fact that um, when I got to shul on Shabbos morning this past week, um, someone who had been on live stream the night before and heard me process, even just very briefly, I was only speaking for about four or five minutes, the school shooting said to me, I watched you online and I saw that you were having difficulty getting the words out. I watched you get choked up. That was one of the ways of pathos, one of the avenues of pathos. It might be outrage, it might be comfort, it's it's not so intellectual. It's it's the feeling. It's the emotional presence of being there. So you need all three of these. You can't you can't abdicate any one of them, because if you abdicate even one, the you become much less productive, much less um, effective. Uh, as either a leader or a thinker on these things. So I'll give you an example of, of all of these. If you have no ethos, if you have no ethical spine on which to hang all of this and or no leadership credibility in any whatso what way, you, I mean, I, I know I'm saying it's sort of um, in a, you know, in a, a deriding derogatory way, you just become an uninformed blogger. By the way, the lack of ethos is what, critics of social media news as the you know, mechanism of getting news through social media, that's what this is, where there's no sense of expertise or credibility. It's just whoever is uh, the biggest, what we call online influencer. And many of those influencers we know are to say the least morally suspect. I apologize to anyone who, uh, lives their lives guided by either of these examples, but an example of high pathos, low logos, and zero ethos is keeping up with the Kardashians or the Real Housewives. They have no credibility. And in fact, they are farcical on the ethics. And then it's the then it's, the, the, it's, it's all pathos. If you don't have any pathos, of course, you're unfeeling, you're robotic, you are someone that no one wants to actually be in a crisis with uh, on the one hand. On the one hand, you totally, you know, this is the person who gets, gets stuff done, but, but you're, you're not the person who's gonna help you through the aftermath of a crisis. And if you have no logos, you're just spinning. You're just absolutely spinning it with emotion. You're, you're, you maybe are maybe very present in a crisis, but you're probably gonna get people hurt or killed. 
if you have no logos. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. That's the model. We're gonna apply it now to processing Uvalde in a second. But are there, um, yes, Victoria said Rabbi Andy had that as well on Saturday. He had, he had a hard time getting through his uh, sermon because it was emotional and it needed to be emotional. If it hadn't been emotional, it would have been an incredibly ineffective sermon because we had just witnessed the loss of 21 people in a school. That should give us all pause. The fact, by the way, that I didn't hear from parents with a high level of pathos evoked pathos in me. Right? The idea of, yes, I am terrified. Right? That's what evoked pathos in me is I was worried that people are now numb to this. Numb meaning uh, their, their, uh, their tank, their gas tank of pathos is on empty, right? Any questions, comments, or thoughts on the three-prong approach? We're now going to apply it in just a moment in our second half of our session together. We're gonna to apply it to, um, to the epidemic of gun violence and specifically school shootings uh, in just a moment. Um, so that, that's coming, but, but any question on sort of the model of how we respond to something that feels overwhelming? The three-prong model. We good or as good as we can be? Uh, Victoria has a question. Is there ever a situation where too much of one is bad? If it pushes out some of the others, I would say yes. And it depends on the situation, right? Um, so I'll give you examples of that. That's a really good question. So I, ha I think I shared this with some of you before. I had a dean in rabbinical school who uh, our senior year in professional skills seminar held up his hand like this. And everyone was, what are you doing? What are you doing? And he said, this is the number of times you can say, because I said so, like it or not, I'm the rabbi. Before you should start looking for another job, right? That is an overuse of ethos. If you do not have logical logos or emotional uh, affiliative power enough to convince people or maybe make it self-evident that people should agree with you and you're only doing it because I said so, even if you are right, that is using too much ethos too often, okay? That's how that one works. If you have too much logos, you become unfeeling. If, um, if Rabbi Markowitz in the immediate wake, or I, I guess you could say uh, on Friday night, I spoke Friday night, he, uh, on our sermon schedule, he, he spoke Shabbat morning. If, if either of us had given a treatise on statistics, statistics of gun violence, or had said, you know, there's something really interesting that happened in Jewish history and completely ignored how people were feeling, um, then that would have felt completely, not only ineffective, but, uh, but uh, actually awful, like mean, right? Um, the, the example of this, oh, thank you, Howard. Um, the, the, the example of this is um, the classic rookie mistake as a rabbi. When people, when you go to a shiva and people of a specific, specifically, un, perhaps unexpected, sudden, uh, you know, every death is tragic, but you know, in those sorts of standards of, of, of tragedy, you go and someone says, Rabbi, Rabbi, I don't understand how could this have happened? And you then go out to the trunk of your car and you come back up to your chin holding a stack of theology books. That is a rookie mistake. That is too much logos. When someone is saying, how could this have happened? You have to have the pathos to say, you're hurting. And maybe even to say, I have no good explanation that's gonna bring you comfort. I'm just here right now, okay? 
And too much, I think you can have too much pathos too. We do, we normally, especially in the wake of a tragedy, we don't like to think of having too much pathos, but you can. You can, and, and, and it very often happens where people just get so angry that they say things that are not only absurd, but actually in some ways hurtful and certainly counterproductive. Uh, so in, uh, in uh, clergy speak, one of the things that clergy need to do is to be what is known as a non-anxious presence. So when I go into a room where people are upset, especially after a tragedy, it's not that I am unfeeling, but if I am bawling out of control, I'm actually doing a disservice to the people who are more proximal to the loss. I've seen this happen, by the way, in receiving lines, which by the way, you should know is a, a, a not a universal practice. It's a very Philadelphia practice, right? Okay, the, uh, the receiving lines in the front row of, of uh, funerals, right? I've watched this happen. I've actually only once that I have to do this, I actually intervened once, which made me feel so unfeeling. But someone came and they were having such a strong emotional reaction and they were like, not even a relative. They were, they were a friend of a family friend, but they were for whatever reason, having an emotional reaction. And I watched as the daughter of the deceased went from the role of bereaved to the role of comforter in the presence of the as yet unburied body of her mother. That's not fair. If you're coming to console, you're not allowed to do that. Joshua, um, uh, and okay, so, so there's a little politics in the Gilad Shalit thing, but there's no question that the pathos there. Now, the pathos is what makes the Israeli society, I don't want to go down this, this rabbit hole too much, what makes Israeli society say, no, we don't leave any soldiers left, you know, no soldiers left behind. That is the pathos. And you are correct that, that the logos of that, the fact is that, that there were uh, the recidivism of those terrorists that were released in, in exchange for Gilad Shalit was it was incredibly high and 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 future problematic. So we know that. By the way, I'm glad on the one hand that Gilad Shalit was released, and I know that others logos. I know that others were endangered because of the people who were released. So that's where these things go. Let's. Um, any other questions before we? Um, uh, Oh, sorry, Victoria says, understand what people need, explanations, empathy, comfort, non-anxious presence, rather than what the leader individual thinks people need. Yes, you have to be careful not to overuse, that would be overusing your ethos, right? Overusing your ethos is say, I know, so I'm gonna tell you what to feel at this moment, right? Um, it's just to be present. That, that pathos does not have to be uh, hysterics. Pathos can be um, quiet presence as well. Um, any, uh, any other questions or comments before? I, I wanna make sure we, we obviously get to the most proximal issue here. Okay. Um, I'm gonna share again, and we're gonna go through each of these three, and I'm gonna give you, and this is where some of you are gonna get angry. And I'm gonna give you that as a disclaimer. It, with my logos and a little bit of my ethos, I'm gonna say some of you are gonna get angry right now because I am going to give you responses on each of these three that make you purposefully make you uncomfortable. Because I would imagine that many of you are sitting firmly in your pathos right now, as well you should on this particular point. And we're gonna start with logos because we have to push against, one of the ways that this model works is that you push against where your disposition instinctively takes you. It's very easy to go where your, where your disposition instinctively takes you. We have to push against that to make sure that there's room for all three. So I'm gonna give you that right now. Here we go. Okay, so now let's start with logos because that's the one that I'm gonna guess in this particular moment, we are, uh, we are not feeling as much, okay? So remember, logos is the intellectual rationalist arguments, right? What we would call in the in the Talmud the shakla vataria, the back and forth and back and forth, the the hyper intellectualized uh, and legalistic 
uh, arguments that rabbis have mostly about things that if you're just living your life and trying to do your best, you don't care about, right? But this is the way that a society is founded. A society is founded, the, the constitution is a document heavy, heavy, heavy in logos because ethos is hard to predict and because you don't know who it is uh, and the ethics of a time often change and pathos is even harder to uh, ride the, you know, stay on top of that fucking bronco, right? Of the, uh, of the emotional uh, zeitgeist of a, of a moment. So here we go. We're going to do a little bit of logos on the Second Amendment. Uh, amendment. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. I'm not going to talk to you about the grammar of it. I know that uh, English teachers would not be happy uh, with the, which clause is uh, you know, consecutive and which clause is dependent on the other clause. All of that is actually relevant. If we were to read this with logos, first of all, let's be honest. The worst thing you can say to someone right after a, they have felt insecure because of a school shooting is let's reread the second amendment together. It is not comforting. It feels inhuman because we're dealing with human life. Right At that point in time, we're dealing with fragility and fear, and we're not talking about what do you think the founding fathers really meant about this. By the way, that's one of the reasons why people in, who do this, and, and it, after a school shooting, it tends to be people who are uh, gun rights advocates, um, why they come off as so unfeeling because they go to their logos, because they say, this is the timeless thing. And yes, it's a tragedy, but I'm not gonna respond emotionally to that tragedy by taking away my guns, which is a constitutional logos right. That's why that feels unfeeling, right? That's why that feels dissonant, right? So I'm going to re I'm going to use some Talmudic terms. This is our logos on this. It doesn't, by the way, mean that there's not a space for logos, especially not in the wake of a, 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 a of a shooting, right? The the timeless principles, right? Um, but here's uh, how how you would read the Second Amendment Talmudically. The first thing you might say is Hilchata Kivatrai which means that the last statement, when there's a series of statements, uh, oftentimes it's rabbi so-and-so says this, rabbi so-and-so disagrees and says this, rabbi so-and-so says this, it's not really clear with that rabbi agrees or disagrees with the first rabbi, is he, you know, where that's going, but whatever, oftentimes the general principle is when there's a series of statements that are uh, given in a row, um, that the halakha, the last statement is what, it, it determines the halakha. So, um, so, if you were reading this and leaning on the principle of Hilchah Ketuvatrai, you would read the second half of that sentence, what's known as the Seifa, which is the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Boom. Right? That's what you would say. Um, now, you would say, but not everyone reads it that way. And that's the second bullet point, which is Vamai Kamipalgi. On what premise do people, do presumably uh, rational people, not stupid people, on both sides of this debate, on what premise do they disagree? And uh, what you might say, uh, Mitchell, I'll get to your point in a second. You might say, um, uh, you might say Mar Savar, one sage, one side reasons that Reisha Tanai Asefa, that the militia clause is a condition on the end clause. And the way you would read that more explicit would be because we currently live in a time where there was not a national army and states had 
given their uh, given their armies, uh, their militias up to the cause of freedom in the immediate wake of the American Revolution, things like Minutemen and stuff like that. The necessity of that in the way that we are going to defend ourselves requires that people should be able to and need to be able to bear arms. If you read it that way, it's not that the Second Amendment is false or needs eradication, it's that it's no longer relevant, right? And then if you say, but my come apology, well, what are they? Then, then you have to say, Umar Sabar, or the other person, meaning the people who don't read it that way, say, ain't naya seifa, that the language shall not be infringed is absolute. And therefore, it doesn't matter what the context of it was in the immediate wake of the American Revolution. That is irrelevant. The statement, the, the purpose of this statement, of this resolution is the end part. So for example, in, in parliamentary procedure, when parliaments or Congresses or frankly, synagogue boards um, make uh, resolutions, these are all those things that say in capital, whereas such and such and such a thing, whereas such and such a thing, whereas, and there are like 17 whereases. And then it says, therefore be it resolved, dot, 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 and be it resolved, dot, 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 and be it resolved. So. Um, when in parliamentary procedure, when you're voting on a on a resolution like that, you don't vote on the whereases, you only vote on the therefore be it resolved, right? And so if you read this as whereas a well-regulated -regul militia being necessary to secure the free state, that becomes irrelevant. That's not actionable. There's nothing about it whatsoever. If those whereases change, who cares? Only thing that matters is the therefore be it resolved. That's the way someone who believes in the timelessness uh, or well, someone who is an originalist, Mitchell, to answer your question, um, I, I would say uh, that it doesn't matter. This is what was said. And, and unless you're going to put an amendment in there, you can't change it. That the, that the condition of the first half of the sentence doesn't bother. This is how you're reading it intellectually, right? Now, there's another way that cuts through all the intellect in a, in a way, which is the, the Talmudic term ha'idna. Ha'idna says... The whole thing's irrelevant. Ha'idna means nowadays. And this is where so many memes come up, right? Nowadays, uh, you know, the, the they didn't imagine um, uh, certain contexts, uh, certain styles of weapons, certain, certain things going on. Everyone, uh, you know, everyone who had a musket was not going to, going to be able to, um, uh, act in the same way as someone with a with a, an assault rifle, th those sorts of things. Um, and nowadays we have to change it because the contexts change. We have this all the time, right? We do this in 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 the Talmud all the time, where you say, I mean, the classic example of this, the most revolutionary example of this, was there were dozens upon dozens upon dozens of laws and mitzvot given in the, uh, assuming that a temple would exist for a sacrificial understanding. And then we say, well, now the temple doesn't exist. We're going to scrap all those and do some totally different thing. Right? Oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Okay. Um, now, the challenge with that is that all of those assume that we know the context and the contexts are not absolute. Um, and uh, I'm going to answer questions in a second, but I see some questions in the chat. So uh, one of the things that we talk about are what are called ta'amei Torah or ta'amei mitzvah. Um, uh, and these are when we try to discern the reason that a mitzvah exists, um, oftentimes we end up messing up the mitzvah. And there's a couple of examples. King Solomon, you know, it's a mitzvah for, uh, for kings as they were to not have uh, multiple wives. And the reason for that is that you'll end up, you know, you'll end up, like King Solomon said, well, I'm gonna have multiple wives, but I'm not gonna go astray because of them. And of course he goes astray and you're not supposed to have tons and tons of horses and military. Why? Well, I'm not gonna, and King Solomon said, well, I'm not gonna go astray because of it. And, and so the idea is that when we start to peddle in reasons for the mitzvot, and this would be the Scalia thing, Mitchell, um, uh, when you start to peddle in reasons for the mitzvot, uh, then it get you go down a a not a slippery slope but a a path by which 
if a, if a changed reason can obviate the actual mitzvah, then what if you're wrong about the reason? Or what if there's greater, uh, what if there's multiple reasons? What if the reasons change? All of those sorts of things. And so um, we are usually discouraged from ab uh, abrogating laws by virtue of a changed context, right? And so that is, so, um, so I would say, all of the rabbis were Talmudists. The question is, some of the rabbis, or more like Rabbi Yitzchak, who um, uh, is more Scalian, as it were, um, at, who uh, you know was arguing against um, abrogating laws based on their original, based on a discernment of their original intent, right? So that that's that's what it is. Barbara, your comment, uh, yes, this is what this is what was disturbing to me too. Why didn't those parents call? Um, uh, you know, uh, why didn't those parents get completely freaked out? And I think in part of it is because that they are numb, they are jaded. Um, pikuach nevich, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, so in some ways it fits in, right? In the sense that all laws, I think what you're saying is all laws are off the table if, um, if we are trying to save a life. Um, that's not entirely true when it comes to saving the system. If you believe that the constitution represents the system uh, and, uh, and that becomes a little complex in terms of when are we supposed to actually, in, allow, we, when, when we are allowed to endanger our lives to preserve the system. That, that gets very complicated. It's a little off, off, uh, off the rails for today. But this is Logos. And Logos doesn't feel great in the wake of a tragedy in the wake of a crime, but logos is important because we can't just be responsive to crimes. We have to have an overarching sort of, we have to have the bones on the, uh, of the system. Now let's do the pathos, which starts with a very simple line. I don't care what the constitution says. Kids are being killed. That's the pikuach nefesh in some way right? We got to change something. I don't care whether there's a process or there's not a process. You want to go through your process? That's great. I don't frankly give a wit about your process. All I care about is that kids are being killed. And so we need to do something. I don't actually even care if that something is actually effective to stop school shootings. We just need to do something. This is what most of the time in the past, parents were responding to me uh, about. I don't care whether your security company says that what I'm proposing is going to make Adith Israel safer. It's just, I need to know that it's going to be safer. I need to feel that way. I'm going to move really quickly because I just looked at the time and, and, and we got to get to ethos too, because uh, in some ways ethos is our biggest problem here. So uh, I'm going to move really quickly. This is uh, one of the quotes, the whole world rests upon the breath of school children. This is, this is an emotional thing. Uh, when Simon and Levi, Shimon and Levi, who end up actually slaughtering an entire village over this, feel that their sister is, has, has been uh, taken as a, uh, and uh, they believe that she has at that point in time actually been sexually assaulted has been raped, um, they, they respond emotionally. Pinchas, we're going to be reading in a couple of weeks, Pinchas sees two people uh, acting extremely inappropriately on the temple steps, and he puts a spear through both of them. He makes a uh, uh, in flagrante delicto shish kebab, right? Okay. And, um, and uh, he is praised for that. Okay. Uh, Heschel is quoted in the context of here saying it's time for moral outrage, a widening darkness between our lucky stars. What a what an image, right? And here's the part that's going to make you all or some of you, I can't assume your politics or your feelings about guns, some of you angry is that there are there is also pathos on the other side of the debate, right? And I, I, you, we don't have time to really go through all of those things right now, but um, these are things that are being said more emotionally than factually. I worry about the officers, right? Um, stop making school such an easy target. That's an argument for putting more guns in schools, right? That's an emotional argument. I feel unsafe. My kids feel unsafe. The way in which I'm going to respond to that, you may disagree with, but I'm responding emotionally to my need for safety. Um, this is not me. I'm, 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 I actually have 
other feelings about this, but but I'm saying this, some of these quotes are saying, I need to feel safe. And the way that I will feel safe is by putting more trained people with more guns in. Now, you may disagree with that, and the data may agree or disagree with that, but the data is irrelevant on this. This is an emotional response of the emotional need to feel safe. All right, I'm, gonna, I'm doing this so quick because we only have one more minute left, and I want to, and I'll stay on for a little bit longer too, of course. Um, the last piece of this, in some ways, is the piece that is so devastating, which is that when it comes to gun violence, we have almost no faith that an ethical leadership will bring us a safer world, right? And so you can see uh, Rabbi Nathan Laufer's comment, once leaders have acquired legitimacy, the formula for establishing future credibility and trust is deceptively simple, promise and deliver. You can see where the uh, the confidence in institutions are almost across the board. And part of this is just society in general being ha having more of an appetite for tearing down all institutions, but Congress's uh, confidence to actually do something. This is 12%. And by the way, that was last year. I'm going to place a wager that it ain't higher. Right? Supreme Court, same thing. Supreme Court hasn't exactly gotten good press this past year, right? Okay, this is where I'm saying, be careful because if you're given, if you are bestowed that leadership capability, you better deliver and you better not do it in a way that's outside your lane. That's the whole sages, be careful with your words, your legal opinions. And that puts us here. This is my last slide. Because when ethos is abdicated, and in many ways, I think this is actually the worst part of, of where we sit right now. We have what's called yeush. Yeush basically means, I have no faith that this is going to happen. And at that point in time, you give up ownership. You give up the ability to care and to be constructive. The reason I'm giving you all of these, and I'll just wrap up with this, Uh, the reason I am giving you all of these is because in order to, to chip away, not even solve, chip away at what seems to be a repeated intractable problem, so much so that as Barbara said, and as I shared with you, it seems that people are almost resigned, resolved to the idea that it's going to happen again, is that we need all three. We need outrage. We need absolute outrage to say, no, this is not acceptable, that we should just assume that there will be a next major school shooting. That is not acceptable. We need leaders in whom we have not given up, we have not done yeush to despair of their ever doing something, such that they use some of their credibility and even some of their, dare I say it, electability, to do something about this, whatever that something is. I don't know what the something is. I'm not an expert on this in any way whatsoever. But in my mind, if we're debating either dealing with mental illness and whether people can responsibly get guns or whether certain guns should exist, it feels to me like a yes and. At least on a trial basis, you want to have something like like uh, like what happened in the in the late '80s that expires after ten years. Uh, you know, fine. Uh, I mean, I, I not my particular thing, but I, again, I'm not an expert on that. I, I'm being careful with my words here. I can't tell you what's going to solve it, but do something so that you don't give up on the ethos. Both parties last week quashed bills. Whether you like those bills or you don't like those bills whether you're a member of one party or a member of the other party or neither, and you hate it all, both parties quashed bills related to gun violence last week. And then you need the logos. You need the data, especially if you're gonna have a trial period of some bill or something like that. You need to look at it and you need to say, okay, let's not spin out of control here. Let's honor the constitution, even a reading of the constitution that we don't agree with, and let's be sensible. 
because we dishonor the memory of those who have been murdered if we don't constructively act, not just act, not just act because we feel like we need to, but constructively act. You need all three. And, and the, the abdication of any one of those three, not only do we not get anywhere, but maybe even we get to a more dangerous place. So that's what I got for you. I don't have answers. I just have three platforms on which we might take a step forward. And if you don't step on all three, if you don't lean on all three, yeah, three-legged stool, exactly. Um, then uh, we will we will find ourselves in this. I, I, I it, it kills me to say it it it, it hurts me. It, it pains me to say that those parents, that Barbara, your daughters are right. We will find ourselves in the same place again, just offering empty thoughts and prayers. I'll just quote something that was on social media that Rabbi Markowitz brought to us this past Shabbat, which is that um, in Judaism, there is a premise that if you say the motzi and you don't eat bread, it's called, it's what's called a bracha levatala. It's a, an empty, annulled, useless, uh, vain blessing. And that is in itself a sin. We need to take action that is not levatala, action that, that has ethos, that has some oomph behind it of ethics and credibility, action that has logos that is sensible in a way that will actually chip away at this problem, won't solve it, chip away at it. And we need to maintain our moral outrage, our pathos, in order to get there. And not just say, what's next on the news? Wish I had a solution for you, but that's at least one way of looking at the problem or three ways of looking at the problem. I wanna acknowledge that um, uh, on here, there were some uh, newcomers. So thank you for that. Some, uh, you know, was it first time, long time, you know, uh, uh, as well. Um, and uh, also, um, I should have said this earlier as I'm looking at the chat right now, Adam Garber was on uh, from uh, Ceasefire PA. So I uh, wanna also acknowledge uh, that as well. Uh, and uh, Ceasefire is an organization that obviously, if I don't know what I'm talking about, they do. So, <laughs> so uh, at least on at least on one, you know, one aspect of this. Um, so uh, hope you're well. I'm happy to stay on for some questions or comments or thoughts as well, but the chat was well used today as well. Thank you all. Have a great summer too, if you have to go. Len, before I get off, it's Howard. I just want to, again, my first time joining in and the value is invaluable. And Rabbi Yanoff and, I mean, seriously, it's like, this is a good thing. And thank you. Thank you for saying it. And thank you for your presence on the chat. That was really helpful too. And Howard, feel free, feel free to suggest colleagues that uh, would want to join us. Yeah, and topics too. We need topics. We always need topics. I have topics, but you're asking me to name names. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Behind the scenes, behind the scenes, you know. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks for a good year of learning. Thanks, Rabbi. Thank you, Victoria. Fun. Thanks for your comments as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Len, can you send us a link to the recording? I uh, will do that. Uh, as soon as I get it, I'll forward it to you, Len, and you can yeah. send it. Fair enough. <sighs> Thank you all. Have a good day. Then I think we're at 43 at our max. That was good. Take care, everyone. I'm going to end it now. Have a good day. Bye-bye.